that so ultimately i think the key takeaway is all you need to do to do math all you need is a curious mind and determination Hey, yeah, sorry, sorry. I changed my answer from to A. I changed my answer to A. Probability of A given B. My bad. The question is: Are you being generous or are you being smart? Because whoever will have a waste of time will not even look at, this, will not even bother to respond, right? Exactly. Fantastic. I mean, Consider all the chief ministers of the twenty-eight states in India, and Nitish Kumar and Stalin of Bihar and Tamil Nadu respectively, in fact, share the same birthday. Sir, it doesn't exactly matter. Vaccinated people who are infected after they were vaccinated could be related to the vaccine, but infected people who are vaccinated could mean that the vaccine is not working on them. You must have said add armor to the most hit areas, while Germany said add armor to the least hit areas. Now, which of these two make more sense? Welcome, everyone. I am Kashmina Jhambad, and on behalf of Team Dmat, I welcome you all to today's presentation. Am I correct? Well, probably. Because this is going to be about the tales of use and misuse of math. I think somehow the very fact that we are all here in this particular webinar is due to sheer chance and some luck. Now, if you ask a mathematician, what do you think about a chance? Then there's a hundred percent chance they're at least going to utter a word probability while explaining it to you. So, well, we all can sit here and figure out the probability or the likelihood that we are in this webinar today, but that's not of much use, right? So, let's dive straight to the point or tail, as a statistician might want to say. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to our today's speaker. Our speaker of the day is a final year. Mathematics and Computer Science undergrad student at Chennai Mathematical Institute. He is a recipient of various prestigious scholarships, including KVPY, Sriram, and NTSC. He loves to explore math, and in general, he enjoys analysis, probability, and function analysis. He is also passionate about teaching and can talk to people or play badminton any time of the day. Let us cheer up for the speaker of the day, the most popular student at CMI. A part of the math family and one of my dearest friends, none other than Master Aniruddin Ganeshwaraman. The stage is all yours, Aniruddin. Take it over. And again, thanks, Kashmira, for the ridiculously kind introduction. And uh, thanks to both you and uh, Kiran sir for inviting me over and having me deliver this talk. It's a pleasure talking to talking to these various bright minds in, as part of GMAT. Um, so I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Um, yes. Uh, can you just confirm if you can see the screen and it is changing? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, uh, let's just dive straight into it. And uh, needless to say, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. And I do not have the agenda to complete all of it. If uh, the, I want whatever I complete, it should be engaging as well as clear to everyone. That's my only goal. Um, so I've divided the entire talk into six things. So First part is if you zone out. So I'll talk about the two, three, four, five, six first. So these are disjoint sections. That is, even if you're not able to understand one section, you will still be uh, very much able to catch me back uh, up on the uh, subsequent section, right? And in the meantime, while you don't want to, while you are not listening to me, I have some problems for you to think about. So that's that's the basic structure. And needless to say, again, um, I just stop me at any time, and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, I hope this will go on for about an hour or so, but yeah. Okay, so let's just start with if you zone out. So these are just problems what I, where I want you to think about. And if you come up, if you manage to come up with a solution, do write to me, reach out to me, right? And I do not intend on discussing these solutions right away here. And I want to give everyone the time to think. So the first question is the following. Okay, you are at a casino, and you bet heads on the outcome of a fair coin. And the amount you bet is your choice, right? So you you decide to bet for how many over dollars or rupees you want, and there is no cap on the number of bets you can place. You can place any amount of bets in succession, right? And also for simplicity, assume you have a huge bank to your avail, and you can just uh, take how much over money you want from the bank and place it in betting. Right? Now the question is, is there a definitive strategy, right? In, co in quotes, which you can use to make money. That's the uh, question. So think about this. And if there is interest and if there is time, maybe we can talk about it towards the very end of the talk without giving any spoilers. Okay. So this is the first question. And this is the second question is not very much related to probability, but it's something like which I think blew my mind when I first saw it. So the question is the following Does there necessarily exist a pair of diametrically opposite points on the Earth's equator that have the exact same temperature? Right. So remember, there are two constraints being imposed. One is they have to be diametrically opposite, and two is 
they have to have the exact same temperature right so if uh, if i remove one of the conditions then it's obvious right that is if i uh, remove the diametrical opposite point does there necessarily exist two points with the exact same temperature then yes i would presume so and does there exist two diametrical opposite points obviously yes right uh, the earth is a sphere and now once you have done thinking about this just extend it a little bit more does there necessarily exist two diametrically opposite points on the earth's surface with the exact temperature as well as pressure right so think about these two problems and so i'll, I'll talk about the second problem a little bit once i'm done with uh, all the slides right um, so this is in fact an, a very important consequence in topology but let's let's not talk about this i hope the question is clear and if i'll just hold on for like 10 seconds here and if there are any questions about the questions let me know and please do not answer them now okay great so let's continue right. so this now this, here's the first section where i'm going to talk about how it's so easy so very easy to lie with statistics and probability how easy it is is what we're going to explore in this section how every day we are being fooled just because of this. So I have a fun question for you guys, okay? So you and your friend have been stranded on, on an island and there's no food except for one single banana. And you and your friend being, being as crazy as you guys are, you, ha you happen to have two pair dies on an island trip, okay? And you say the following, if the biggest number among the two dice is one, two, three, or four, then you give your friend the banana. And if it is five or six, then you yourself eat the banana. So the question I'm asking is, are you being generous or are you being smart? That is in another, in other words, will your friend get the banana or will you yourself get the banana? Does anyone want to give a try? Uh, type out your questions in the chat. Let me just make the table for that. Like, give me a minute. Okay, sure, take yeah. it. Participants who might have just joined, I think you all can, uh, I think Anirudhan, you can just um, go away with explanation of the question once again. And we have just started. So maybe you haven't missed much. Okay, but, sure. So, so the, the questions, are the, the, the single question is the following. So you and your friend have, have been standing and you happen to have two dice with you, let's say pair dice. And you say, uh, if the biggest number in the rolls of the two die is one, two, three, or four, then you take the banana. If it's five or six, I'll take it. The question is, are you being generous or are you being smart? That is, you're being generous. Um, why is that? Because out of like, because the thing is, you can like, you can have thirty-six different combinations for what? the two dice that are rolling, right? Thirty-six different outcomes, and out of every six pairs of uh, out of every six outcomes. Four of them belong to uh, four of them will roll up. Uh, four of them will have one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, right? So Correct. both of uh, so the bo both of the dice will have numbers one, two, one, three, one, four. That's why your friend will take the banana. That's a fantastic progress, but there's a slight issue with your argument. So uh, I agree mm -hmm. completely until you said there are four of them. So the uh, the four of them aren't for all the six cases. Do you want to? No, sorry, sorry, no, sorry, not so, yeah. not all the four. You have uh, for one, two, three. I I miscount one, two, three, and four. I I, I miscounted the five and six ones. My bad. So and so, yeah. what's the chance that my friend gets the banana? Uh, how many cases is that amounting to? Four times four, right? Six and six, twelve. Twelve chances that you're gonna get the banana, and then no, sixteen chance. Yes. 6, 12, and 18. Okay. Square. Okay. Yeah. 1, so 2, 3, 4. These 16 red chances. 16, 16, 16. 16, 16, 16 yeah. Losses, my friend is going to get the banana. Whereas in these 20. Okay. You're losses, being smart. You're being smart. You're being smart. Right? Yeah. So the, what, smart, what, is the, what is the paradox in this? Does someone wish to clarify? Who was that who answered? Palash, was it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's the paradox in this? Any idea? 
Okay. If you, you get can... the banana, you're going to share it too. Right. Okay. No, let's not assume that I'm that, that generous. I'm not, I'm smart. I'm not generous. Okay. So the okay. paradox is that I have, these are four possibilities, right? My friend getting the banana hmm. has one, two, three, or four. That's four possibilities. But that yeah. in fact has, if you do the math, right, that in fact has a lesser chance of uh, your friend getting the banana. But if I mm. if I say just restrict myself to five or six, I in fact stand a higher chance, right? Yeah. So this is where this is where your uh, intuition goes wrong, right? So mm. we'll see a couple of many more examples in uh, such uh, a setting, right? So uh, so these are the six by uh, these are the possible outcomes, right? The rolls of the two die. These are the thirty six possible outcomes, and. Uh, so uh, what was the initial condition? We said if the maximum number is one, two, three, or four, the maximum number is one, two, three, or four for these conditions, for all the red ones, right? And the maximum number is five or six for all the black ones. And how many of these red ones are there? 16. And how many of these black ones? 20, right? So there is, in fact, I stand a higher chance if I, if I opt for five or six than if I opt for one, two, three, or four. So that's that's where the paradox kicks in. Okay. Right. So let, let's move on to the next. So this is something like which uh, which I was really amused the first time I looked at it. So you have a survey. The options are the following. I love responding to sample surveys. That's I respond to whatever I get, and they're a waste of time. I don't bother looking at it. Right. And I'll just dive straight into the answer. If a survey is conducted like this. The results almost always seems to be like this. Why is this? Because whoever will have a waste of time will not even look at this, will not even bother to respond, right? Exactly. Fantastic. And because whoever will have a waste of time will not even look at this, will not even bother to respond, right? Exactly. Fantastic. I mean, the I mean the data will be skewed towards the people who respond to surveys. Exactly. Right, so this is what is this in fact has a term in statistics. This is what is called sampling bias, and we will see later in the day that this is this has been used at a very high level. So I'll not give any spoiler at the moment. So you'll see a major mistake, major blunder using sampling bias at an international level. Okay, so let's get to that in maybe like say 30 minutes from now. Okay, next, how many of you have seen this photo? Anyone? I, I'm not able to see chats. So if you guys are typing something, oh, then Palash has. He says he has. And okay. is anyone else raising their hands? I don't see anyone else. Okay, great. So, right. So this, in fact, so for those who haven't seen it, um, so during World War II, USA and Germany were independently studying the extent of damage on their planes, which were returning from a mission. And their objective was to identify which parts of the plane to strengthen more, that is, which parts of the plane to add armor to, so that they can lose the least number of planes, right? That was their objective. And so statisticians were roped in and they had to do a whole bunch of studies on the planes that were returning back, right? But uh, what happened, their statisticians, USA's statisticians and Germany's statisticians came up with diametrically opposite recommendations. USA said, add armor to the most hit areas while Germany said add armor to the least hit area. Now, which of these two make more sense? Germany. Yes. Why? Because you are adding armor to the most hit areas basically means that the plane came back. So it's already reinforced, you know, like it, it doesn't make sense to strengthen the parts that are strong. You need to strengthen the parts that are weak because the ones, because the airplanes that went down Obviously, like like that was shot down. Obviously, they had the bullets in the least hit areas. Fantastic explanation, right? So, uh, what what did I initially start it's, off? With? What, it just makes more sense to add equal amount of armor in both the most and least hit areas. Then you won't need to take the risk of losing any planes. That's a very good point, but the cost factor always kicks in, doesn't it? Precisely. So you want to be identified. So I yeah. wish there is no such thing. So I, but those people wish there is no such thing as money. 
Ah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. So let's talk about this after the session. That's, that's a very good point you raised. In fact, I've had debates with my sister about this. So I do want to continue it with you to see what your thoughts are. Okay. So coming back to the point. So we have to add, Palash said, we have to add armor to the least hit areas because the areas which did not take any hit or which took the least hit, those planes never, some of these planes never returned, right? So even if, if you add armor to the most hit areas, at least you're assured that these guys return, right? So in fact, that's the reason why I showed you this pick. There, there are no dots on the engine, but if someone puts a gun at the engine, it's certainly, almost certainly going to fall down, right? And similar case, similar is the case with the tail, right? Or, or with the nose, right? So these are like some examples of how you can very easily convince people about the exact yeah, wrong thing. The in the middle, if they blast it in the middle, based on the structure of the plane, if they blast it uh, somewhere around the fuselage, in between the, the circular thing and the start of the tail fin, then they can easily just split the plane in two. There's absolutely no need for any hardships. They can just uh, kick off the uh, tail thing of the plane. It's, it's absolutely easy. It's a way to capture more enemy soldiers. Oh, wait, no. So I'm talking here, I'm talking about, okay, I think we're drifting off a little bit. So the point I'm trying to make is here, you're talking about the planes which US is sending and the planes which Germany is sending. So they're examining the, their own planes. Yes, sir. Um, but oh, you can they, call me by name. You don't need, sir. I'm just... Yeah, I'm just yeah, remarking that if they hit it somewhere around the middle, uh, the, somewhere around that circular thing and the tail fin, then they can easily just capture more people. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That answers your question. Yes, that does answer your question. Right? Yeah. So, yep, that's that's a, that's a good observation. Okay, so let's let's move on. Okay, so now I, I'd like all of you to type your uh, date and month of your birthday in the chat. I'm hoping this works out, but even if it doesn't, I have some backup. So just, just type in your birthdays in the chat and I'll just type in mine as well. Okay. So all I'm hoping for is the following. Let, you guys keep typing and I'll just uh, I'll just continue talking. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Kashmira, tell me if you see someone with the same birthday. Okay. So what do you think is the minimum number of people in a group so that there is a definitive chance of two people having the same birthday? What do you think is the number? Yeah, it'd be 367. Excellent. And why is that? Uh, because uh, an year has usually 365 days. And uh, we can take tops uh, the leap year, which has 366 days. So okay. by the pigeonhole principle, if we have some 367 people, then two of them should have the same birthdays Fantastic. at any cost. Fantastic, right? So the idea of pigeonhole principle for those who aren't aware is that say you have uh, you have 366 boxes. Okay, think of each box as a date of birth. Now, if you have 367 people then there must be at least one box which has at least two people, right? That's essentially what the pigeonhole principle says, and this is something which is massively used. Even though the statement may seem stupid, it's something which is extremely useful, right? And this is what we use to answer this, this particular question, right? Now, I'll tweak the question a little bit. Here, we had earlier asked about what is the definite, we wanted a definitive chance that two people have the same birthday, right? Now, what I'm asking is, what what are uh, what is the minimum number of people so that there is at least a fifty percent chance that two people share the same birthday? Right. So I just assume that. So now, uh, like I think uh, most people are born in like say August, September, no, uh, October these months. But let's just assume for now that every day have an equal probability of uh, that's one by three sixty five is the probability of a random person's birthday on that given date. Right. So and ignore all these leap years, twins, etc. For just some simplicity. Right, so uh, a year has 365 days, okay? And so I think at least a few thousand people, if you if, if you take the whole world population, okay, have uh, like there's at least there's a baby being born right now, most probably. Yep. Yeah. So so there's a, at least 
uh, you could say two pages per ten minutes. You don't know. Is, uh, so there is, will be at least a few thousands to a few million people uh, who have shared the same birthday. If you take the whole world population and you can fit them into one zone. Oh, correct. But the question is minimum. So, what do you think is the minimum number of people so that there's at least a 50? 173. Um, okay, how do you come up with that number? I mean, I just did uh, like, I don't know, I'm just guessing at this point, but 367 people were right. guaranteed. Uh, but in the case of 367 people, you were you had a 100% chance of getting like uh, two people who had the same birthday. So, you just divide that by two. 367 by two, you get 173, right? Okay, that makes Almost sense. Almost yeah, 173.574 Jitna. Yeah. yeah. That makes it 183, yeah, 183, but... Oh, sorry, but, 183, 183, right. but, uh, 183. in fact, you can go a little bit lower, in fact, much lower. Hmm. 183, see, even with 180, yeah, 183 would make sense, but you can go slightly lower. By slightly, I mean, like, yeah, much lower. Let's talk about the answer, but does anyone else want to take a guess? Let's not reveal the answer. Let other people guess. I guess <laughs> this is very interesting. Oh, give me a range. Say, um, uh, let's let's split. Uh, less than thirty, less than fifty, less than seventy, less than ninety. Where do you think ideally it should fall? So in fact, the answer is 23. With just 23 people, I have more than a 50% chance that two people share the same birthday, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why, why this magic number 23 comes up. But in the meantime, think about what happens if there are 50 people? What happens if there are 75 people? What, uh, what is the chance that two people share the same birthday? Remember, the question is reversed now. Earlier, the question was, I'm given a 50% chance. And what do you think is the minimum number of people? Now, the question I'm asking is, if there are 50 people, what's the chance that two people share the same birthday? If there are 75 people, what's the chance that two people share the same birthday? Right? That's the question I'm asking. Think about this. And in the meantime, we'll answer why 23. Okay. So, what, what is our objective? We want to find out the minimum number of people so that at least two people share the same birthday. Right? Now, as is common in math, what we'll do is we'll negate the statement, right? What I mean by that, instead of looking at at least two people having the same birthday, I'll look at the chance that no two people have the same birthday, right? How do I, how do I compute that number? I have 23 people, right? If I have 23 people, uh, the first person can be born on any of the 365 days. Remember, we, we assumed it's not a leap year, right? And the second person can choose any of the 364 days to be born on, right? Similarly, the 23rd person can choose any of the remaining 343 days to be born on, right? And since it's probability, I'm just uh, going to divide all of this by 365, right? So, so that I get a number less than one. If I multiply all of this, I get a number which is close to 0 0.49. Let's go back again. What is this number? This number is the chance that no two people share the same birthday, right? If there are 23 people, right? So if I want at least two people to share the same birthday, I have to take one minus 0 0.49, which is a 0 0.51. So now are you convinced that if there are just 23 people in a group, there is a 50% chance that they have the same birthday, right? This is something which is extremely counterintuitive. And I'll return back to Palash's statement. In fact, there is a really nice argument as to why the dividing by two is something which is natural, but it is not as correct as it should be. Right? I'll return back to that statement. And in the meantime, let's see. How did I come up with this number 23? That's because of this. Right? So all what you take is 365, 364, all the way up to 366 minus n. Right? And you compute that value of n such that this number is less than 0 0.5, right? And so, as, as is remarked here, so for a 50, uh, can you see my pointer, Kashmira? 
Yes. Okay, great. So if you if you need a 50% chance, it's somewhere lying between 20 and 30, right? Between 23, right? Now, the fun part is here. If there are 50 people in a group, then you have almost a 95% chance that two people share the same birthday, right? And if there are 75 people in a group, there is almost a 99.7% chance that they share at least there are at least two people who share the same birthday, right? So now let's see, let's see why does this misconception occur? It is because our brain struggles to process functions which are not linear, right? So there have been tons of articles about this. So if it so returning back to uh, Palash's claim about this dividing by two. So that everything that the brain does is assumes linearity, right? If it's linear, it's something which is very nice to process, right? So let's let's just think of this. So you have 23 people in a group, right? So if you have done a little bit of combinatorics, you'll see that the number of ways of choosing two people from this 23 people is, I think, 23 times 22 divided by two, right? 23, you can choose the first person and 22 is the way you can choose the second person. And you're dividing by two because the order in which you choose them doesn't matter, right? So this itself gives you around 253 possibilities, right? And similarly, if you have 50 people, right? You shoot up to 50 times 49 divided by two, which is, oh no, I can't do that. Okay, so this is, I think, 1,225 or something, right? So at 23, it is somewhere around 253. And at, at 50, it's some 1,200 something. So the way it shoot ups is so large that our brain can't process it. And that's the reason why the non-linear functions are hard to visualize, right? And so that's that's kind of explains why uh, it's counterintuitive, right? And so in fact, a real life example of this, consider all the chief ministers of the 28 states in India and Nitish Kumar and Stalin of Bihar and Tamil Nadu respectively, in fact, share the same birthday, right? So with this 28 states, things are nice, right? So yeah. So now maybe a good point uh, uh, to catch back up on if you have if you have lost me is that uh, in the first section. Um, so I'll, I'll now what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about how math is misleading us in the, these COVID times. How the media houses etc are portraying things wrongly just to grab eyeballs, and whereas the reality is in fact different. Right? That's what I do want to talk about now. And so remember, we spoke about sampling bias earlier, uh, the case where we had a poll wherein the options where I like responding to polls and I don't like responding to polls. And I promised you to talk about a blunder in the international level. So that's what I'll start off with. So on 22nd May 2020, a paper was published in Lancet. So Lancet is considered to be one of the most reputed medical journals. Right? So the claim was that hydroxychloroquine is making the situation worse. Right? But in India, ICMR, that is the Indian Council of Medical Research, they conducted a trial and they found that uh, HCQ, hydroxychloroquine, gave fairly decent results. Not too bad that they had to immediately stop all trials, which is precisely what WHO did. On 23rd May, WHO stopped all clinical trials of hydroxychloroquine. Right? Now, it turns out the authors of the Lancet paper made an issue in which uh, they, they had an issue in how they sampled their uh, 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 people for study. So they may what what is going on around is that they may have carried out sampling just for the symptomatic patients and have excluded the whole spectra of asymptomatic COVID positive patients in their study, right? And this is what falsely gave a high fatality rate. Right. So sampling bias again, it is everywhere, right? So uh, I I can talk about it a little bit about how it affects in the case of. Uh, or what you may have heard about exit polls or opinion polls in India. But if there's time, we'll come back to it towards the very end. But uh, for now, like I think my objective is to give you a little bit of a sniff of all the food that's on the plate. Right? So, and I think a takeaway here should be it's okay to make mistakes. Right? Everybody makes mistakes. So just because you made one mistake doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Right? So. Uh, that's that's a key uh, like uh, philosophical math takeaway here right and now this is i think i can go on for days about this so this is what is called bayes theorem right so how many of you have heard of bayes theorem anyone 
Mm -hmm. I see two hands being raised up. Okay, great. That's Very good. Real. Not bad. Okay. Probably consider my hand as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So based here on what it says, if you have two events, A and B, okay. So let's in fact do it with an example. Okay. So let A be the set of all people who have died due to COVID. Okay. And B be the set of all people who are less than 60 in age. Okay. Remember, A and B are just sets of people. Okay. Now, um, you can see that, uh, like based on, say, uh, past data, you have an opportunity to compute P of A, right? The probability of A, that is the probability that uh, a person has died due to COVID. You can compute that, and that comes out to be about 5%. Okay. And, uh, and from census data, you can find out that. The chance that a person is less than 60 is 0 0.92. That's 92% of the people are less than 60, right? And again, from the survey data of COVID, you can say that if a person is less than 60, then, sorry, if, if a person has died due to COVID, then the, num the chance of that person being less than 60 is a mere 20%, right? So we have to get the order straight here. That is, if a person is less, if a person has died due to COVID, the chance that a person is less than 60 is 20%, right? That's there are only 20% of the people who have died due to COVID who are less than 60 years of age, right? Now we'll, we'll use this weird looking formula, right? I do not intend to prove this formula because you'll see it in your math course or where you, you'll see the proofs is uh, proofs are everywhere, right? But what is missing is the understanding of this statement. And that is all I intend to give you, not the proof. And proof you can look it up if you're interested. Now let's just plug all these values in. What am I interested in computing? I'm, compu I'm interested in computing. If a person has died due to COVID, the chance that their age is less than 60. Sorry, if if a if a person has age, if a person is less than 60, uh, what's the probability that they they died due to COVID? Right. That's what I'm interested in computing. And I plug in all these numbers, and it's just one percent. Right. Mind you again that this was in the time of this data. I took it from the time of I think the first first wave, I think. And so now now things have changed. Now things are a little bit different. Right. So this this value would this value will go up. That is P of B given A will go up. And so there are there are things like these. But back in the first wave, so this is something which was which there was heavy misreporting on. Right. But this is again yet again counterintuitive. Right. So another fact we will see, another misapplication of base here. This is a question for you guys. So let A be the set of all people who are infected due to COVID. Okay. And let B be the set of all people who are vaccinated. Okay. Now the question is, which of these two matter? If a media publishes a report, should they concentrate on the chance that an infected person is vaccinated or should they concentrate on the chance that a vaccinated person is infected? Which one should I be spreading news about? A vaccinated person is infected, B1. B. Um, yeah, probability of B given A. Okay. And uh, Adrit, do you have an, another answer? Same, same, same. Okay, so both of you are going for probability of B given A. Shouldn't it be probability of A given B? And why is that? Because... um. Given that they're vaccinated, you want to know how many are getting infected. Yes. Okay, that, that's one argument for probability of A given B. And does one of, say, Palash or Adrit want to explain their answer or why P of B given A? Sir, it doesn't exactly matter. Vaccinated people who are infected after they were vaccinated could be deleted to the vaccine. But infected people who are vaccinated could mean that the vaccine is not working on them. That's exactly what I want to address. So to so to talk okay, about sorry, sorry, I changed my answer from to A. I changed my answer to A. Probability of A given B. My bad. I want to know whether the vaccine is working well or not, basically. Yes. Yes, that's exactly What's the probability right. that the vaccine is working well or not. Yes, to to talk about whether the problem, whether the vaccine is working or not, I have to in fact focus on probability of A given B, that option A and not option B, right? L let's just see why. So let's consider hundred people in uh, hundred people population. Okay, let uh, help me with colors. Okay, let's say this green and orange, this these uh, eighty nine green dots and this one orange dot. 
let this be the set of all people who are vaccinated okay now uh, these 10 people that's the black and the red dot are the set of all people who are not vaccinated right 10 percent haven't been vaccinated now there are four infections suppose there are four infections out of which one is in the vaccine vaccinated category and three are in the non-vaccinated category right so now can we can in some sense can we use this anyway so what is this probability of b given a b the probability that an infected person is vaccinated is 0 0.75 right so this is this is what i'm worrying about now if i plug in all these values right so i'll just i've just written out the uh, diagram here in a population of 100 90 are vaccinated uh, and out of four three are vaccinated and one is not right now the question is what do we use to conclude that the vaccine is not working right so what we in fact take is find the probability of a given b which is 3 over 90 right this is in fact what we have to worry about and our goal should be to reduce this right so the lower the lower this number the better it is right so and in fact this the other quantity the probability of b given a is going to increase as the number of people take uh, as the number of people who have taken vaccines increase right so ultimately your key takeaway should be to go and get vaccinated no matter what okay um that's that's the that's some philosophical takeaway again here and so things yeah so this is just one one thing which i wanted to add in because this is something like what i felt was the need of the app. so that like ridiculous arguments going on around about uh, the vaccine not being safe and all that and so i thought I'll, if i'm talking about probability i thought i really should address this once and for all okay um Right, so let's just move on. So yet again, if you have lost me in the last part, which I think there may be some because it's a little bit math intensive. Uh, so now, now is a good time to catch me back up on. And uh, this from now, it should be hopefully a smooth sail. There aren't, uh, I, I, I don't think there are any more equations after this. Okay, um, how am I doing on time, uh, Kashmira? How long do I have? Okay, I'll just go for like 20 more minutes probably. Yeah, you still have 20 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so uh, here I'm going to talk about how probability is used, rather misused, sir. and this is where the misused came in the title in court cases. Uh, sir, sir, uh, um, sir, a coincidence I just noticed right now is that you have 20 slides left and you have 20 minutes left. Ah, nice. Okay, that, that's a good observation. Wow. Okay, that means I should run fast. 20 slides is approximately half of the slides I have pending. So I have to run. Thanks for pointing that out. But we can organize one more seminar. Need not run fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how probability is used in court cases and uh, uh, how it is being used to convict people wrongly. Right. So before moving to that, let's consider this. So there's a guy who's terrified of flying. And because he read somewhere that the chance that a bomb is on a plane is one in 8,000. So let's not worry about how one comes up with this number, but let's just, this is just something which is given and you uh, trust, the, you believe that fact, right? The chance that there is a bomb on the plane is one in 8,000. And pre-COVID times, it, it's a fact that around nine, the expected number or the average number of flights in the sky is somewhere around 9,700, right? And so, he did maths being a genius he did math and found out there is at least one plane which will have a bomb he reached out to that he came to that conclusion okay and being the extremely scientific guy he is so what he does is he consults an, consults an astrologer okay and this guy being even more of a genius what he suggests is you carry a bomb with you on the plane okay the chance that there are two bombs is one in eight thousand times one in eight thousand which is one in 64 million and there are only, there are still 9,700 or 9,800 planes in the sky. And this probability, that is 9,700 over 64 million is min secure. And now, I'm, now I feel fairly safe, right? So think about this, whether the astrologer is correct, okay? Think about this and we'll get back to the answer in a while. Okay, in the, the slide after this video. The astrologer did the wrong math and just wanted to come, uh, uh, just told the man uh, that it's okay, it's okay, you can just do this. 
so it, it actually is one uh, by eight thousand plus one by eight thousand. Um, why is it plus? Because sir, you have uh, sir, if you do the fraction addition, that you add the two, two in eight thousand, and so there's the chance that they are, yeah. No, 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 no. It, it's not going to be a plus. See, when do you use plus? Plus is usually for if you're treating the chance that this happens or this happens. Oh, oh, oh. That's I, when you use a plus. I think the astrologer is doing the correct math. Oh, he's doing the correct math? Okay. Does anyone want to counter Adrit? I would also like to encourage people who haven't yet spoken, I would say. Yeah, do encourage and participate. I think this is a fun question. I mean, I personally used to be terrified of flying in planes because of maybe not bomb, but hijacking after seeing it <laughs> movies or something like that. Okay, so I think uh, we will come back to this answer in a while. So the other question is, so after, after the next slide, I'll, I'll uh, answer both of these, right? Okay. So back was an English judge, okay? And she lost her first son within three weeks after his birth. And they had an autopsy done, and it pointed to what was called the sudden infant death syndrome. And there's a genetic disorder, okay? And a little over a year later, her she lost her second son also. And this was within eight weeks after his birth. And so a month later, Sally was Sally Clark was both arrested and tried for the death of her own children. Right? And the argument which the prosecution gave was the chance that a baby passes a baby from a well-to-do family passes away from six is one in eight thousand five hundred. And the chance that two children pass away is one in seventy-three million which is too rare of an event uh, to happen here. And so you're convicted, right? So you, you do see a similarity between the two events, right? That of Sally Clark and that of the advisor, except that Sally Clark was an actual event, but I wouldn't be surprised if the astrological thing also happened somewhere on the earth. So now the question is, where are they wrong, right? They are wrong. Both the prosecution is wrong as well as the astrology. They said that her second son also passed away within eight weeks of his birth. We yes. don't know whether that was sudden death, uh, infant death syndrome yes. or not. It was it. It was it. It was sudden, uh, sudden infant or, death, or at least infant that's what death the autopsy syndrome. pointed out. The second son passing yes. away. Yes. And now but the sudden in yeah. but the sudden infant death syndrome is genetic, right? So yes. in obviously within genet if within Sally uh, if Sally passes between uh, to two children, obviously the the chances that it, that the child will get sudden infant death syndrome would be higher. Exactly. You can't use one over eight five four three for uh, because that's for the normal people, right? Who don't fit in. Fantastic answer, right? This is this is exactly what is called independence of event, right? So let's we'll talk about two first and then come back to one. So this is exactly what is called. Independence of events. The two events are not independent of each other. If one of her sons has a genetic disorder, then it's a high chance that her second son will also have the same genetic disorder, right? So you cannot simply just multiply the two, right? So this this will get a little bit technical, but I'm going to avoid all of it and just say that there is something called correlation, which you need to use, right? So in fact, the probability will be much less than sorry, much higher than one in seventy three million. Right. So, yeah. So that 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 explains the second part, right? And the first part is something which is even more fundamental to probability, and that's called conditional probability, right? So uh, coming back to uh, Adrit's statement, uh, so the astrologer was right. Easy. So see, you have two events which are happening, right? Now I know that. Uh, in the plane which in which the R, R, R man, if I can call is traveling, uh, he there is definitely a bomb on that plane, right? That's something which I know for sure that there is a bomb on that plane, right? So, what is this is what is called a conditional probability. That is, if if you if you are given some information, your probabilities of events will change. That's something which is never taken into account, right? So. If you're given that our man has 
a, a, a bomb. He's carrying a bomb in the plane. And there are reasons to assume that uh, the probability of some random guy bringing, bringing a bomb to the plane is independent of our guy bringing a bomb to the plane, right? So the chance that both of these happen, here it can be multiplied. On the numerator on the right-hand side, it can be multiplied to get 1 in 64 million, right? But my sample space is restricted to all those cases when our man brings a plane. Uh, uh, sorry, our man brings a bomb, right? And the chance of that happening is 1 in 8,000. So when I do the math here, I'm still stuck with a 1 in 8,000 probability that there is a bomb on the plane, right? So the astrologer was, in fact, making a fool of himself, right? So he has not reduced the chance of there being a bomb on a plane by asking that person to carry a bomb, right? So this is what is called conditional probability and independence. There are fantastic areas to explore in this, and I'll, I'll give you hopefully some references towards the very end where, where you can read a little bit more about them, right? Um, okay, so now this, this is an exercise for you, and this, I think, the answer is obvious. So there's a woman who came, who was coming out of a shopping mart. So this I think happened. Uh, this did happen, and if I'm not if I'm not wrong, this is somewhere I think in the California in the 1980s, right? Uh, so a woman was coming out of a shopping mall, and she was ready to load her uh, load her trunk with the goods she bought, right? And then she claimed that she she was hit on the head by uh, someone. And uh, while by the time she regained situational awareness, she saw a white woman with a blonde ponytail who was running away with her purse. So she ran down the street, and down the street was a man with a black beard, was a black man with a beard and a mustache waiting in a yellow car, right? And another man happened to notice by, and they came to uh, give evidence in court, right? Now, based on this, a guy named Malcolm Collins was convicted. Now, and the evidence that was presented was the following. The chance that a black man has a beard is 1 in 10. And 1 in 4 men have a mustache. 1 in 10 white women have a, a ponytail. 1 in 3 white women have blonde hair. 1 in 10 automobiles are yellow. And there's a 1 in 1,000 chance that there is an interracial couple in the car. Mind you, this was back in 1980s, right? And so does anyone want to guess what happened next? So what, what happened next was the prosecution just said, let's multiply all of this. The chance that this exact scenario happens is 1 in 12 million, which is too low of a chance for it to actually happen. right? And Malcolm Collins was convicted for this. right? So these are like some, some things where uh, probability is used very wrongly in court cases also. right? And now, um, Okay, so I think I'll just uh, quickly rush through the. Uh, so this is where I'd like to. So I, again, this is a place where you can catch me back up on if you have lost me in the previous section. And okay, so this here I intend to talk a little bit about how uh, the present applications of probability in in the real world, and it's majorly tied to what is called cryptography, right? So I'll I'll talk about it. I'll talk about it in detail in a bit. The objective of cryptography is the following. There are two people, Alice and Bob, right? Alice wants to send a secure message to Bob, right? So she wants Bob to read it, but if there's any Charlie or Eve on the way, uh, she does not want any of them to read it. That is, only Alice and Bob should be uh, the, uh, or they should be the only ones who know the message, right? Now, uh, the natural question to ask is, what do you do to accomplish this task? How does Alice have to send the message to Bob, right? and this is what a major work in cryptography is all about, right? Now, this now let's go back to the Roman times, right? This is in about 50 BC. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that is. It's a lot of years ago, right? So well, that's one of the simplest encryption techniques that was used is what is called the Caesar cipher, right? So what Caesar cipher does is it encodes each letter by a shift. What I mean by that is you have you, you write down these letters, right? A, B, C, D, all the way up to Z. 
and you shift the letter by you shift these you, you shift this alphabet by three right so you put uh, so say d uh, okay so you go a a goes to x b goes to y that is you rotate it and you shift it by three right so this i think is a nice example so if you align a with uh, say your x here with x yeah if you align a with x the matching letters is what will encode your letter right for example if i say i hope this is fun it's going to be uh, encoded as f e l m b q e f p f p c r k right and if someone just sees this message they're not going to make any sense out of it right so this is not written in plain text right now but this you do agree that it doesn't take enough work it doesn't take a lot of work to crack it right i can simply try reversing this process that is i can try all possible letters for f i can try all possible letters for e and i can in just 25 attempts i can easily decrypt the message right? can someone tell me why it's not 26 okay so think about it why why it can't be 26 um so it's easy to decrypt this message easily all i have to try is these 25 possible options and once i make sense of it i'm done i i, I get to read the message right now another way you can decrypt it the smarter way of decrypting is uh so you can in fact it's it's uh there is statistical evidence that uh, letters like e t a etc are the most used in any uh, are the most used letters in the english alphabet right so if you're sending a long message say thousand characters or so then you find out which letter appears the most right and you try mapping it to e t or a right and use that to figure out what the shift is right remember in arcas that shift was three you start to figure out what the shift is and then try to decrypt all the you try to decrypt the message in, in other words you need not go through all of it you need not go through all the 25 letters but just three or four letters will ideally give you the correct answer of what the shift is right and other and other uh, easy way to do this you you send out a long paragraph right you encrypt a paragraph and you send that all of it out now uh, so say words like uh, T H E, D and the uh, in as etc so these are going to be uh occur these are going to occur frequently right T H E, T H E, I think is going to code to q e b here b for bravo right so q e b if it occurs frequently you can find out that the shift is three right and if you say something like say if, if there is another shift uh say uh r f c Right, then the shift is like i think four right so with these patterns you can easily recognize also what the shift are, right? so ultimately like this is something which is strong but not as strong as what one would want it to be right so this calls for a much better cipher and this is where enter the genius of alan turing okay not in making the cipher but in fact cracking the cipher see we were able to crack this right this is not too hard of a task like if I just put on some, if I put on some music and if you give me a text to crack, I might as well do it, right? So I just have to try 25 possible, uh, 25 possible choices, right? I, I can do this in a day or so, right? But this is where there's something called Wigner cipher, which in fact improves upon the bounds of the Caesar cipher, right? So in a Wigner cipher, what you need is what is called a cryptographic key, okay? Let's not talk about what it exactly means, but let's just assume there's some keyword which is to be given to you, right? And the message I want to communicate to just you and no one else is, I hope this is fun, okay? Now, uh, what we'll do is the following. We'll line up, right? Prob, 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 okay? We'll keep lining up until the message is exhausted, right? The message has some number of characters, right? Three plus two plus, I don't know, some 13 characters, I think. So I'll, I'll line it up, I'll keep repeating the key, right? What I'll do is for the first character, I, the way I'll encrypt I is the Caesar cipher, which takes A to P, right? What I mean by that is if, if I want to encode I and the keyword is P, right? The word, the letter right above I is P. So I'll take a look at P and I'll take a look at the Caesar cipher, which takes A to P. Right? If A is taken to P, then
then i is taken to x right next if uh, next I'll, I'll i'll have to encode h right the way i encode h is i'll take a look at the letter above it which is r and i'll encode h with the caesar cipher which takes a to r right so the caesar cipher which takes a to r is this and the letter h i think is y okay i think i've typed i hope i've typed this correctly so the caesar cipher which takes uh, a to r encodes h as y right so similarly you can encode all of it and you you can send out this message right so what is so what is one advantage of this cipher over the other cipher so let's see that now in the previous cipher as you may have seen if you have say uh, two i's okay so there is an i in this and also an i in is right both of them are encoded as f right and similarly uh, if there are e's in the cipher text right so that's there is an e here and there is also an e here right both of these are h right so this is something that is if i get one letter then i'll get to know everything about it right so this is what i don't want to happen so that is in fact the genius of uh, this this cipher so for example if you take the h here okay there is an h here and there is also an h here one of them goes to y and the other goes to v right this is simply because r is here and the letter above this h is o right similarly uh, what letters repeat here so uh, okay let's say g here right? a g here in the cipher text correspond to s and f respectively right so this is something which is slightly more powerful than the usual caesar cipher so this is something which is slightly stronger now the question is can i crack it is it crackable right so this is a question which took the genius of alan turing to answer so for about 300 years this was assumed that this cipher is not crackable that is it is a perfect cipher and everything can be done just with this right but Alan Turing, he in fact gave a probability based method to crack this entire encryption scheme. That is, it's not safe. It's not safe. That's what Alan Turing came up with, right? And I'll not get into the details, but I'll put out references. So the idea is that you use Bayes' theorem, and yet again, the fact what we used earlier, that is, E, T, A, I, etc., are the most used letters in the English alphabet, right? So we use a little bit of base here. I will not get into these technicalities since it may get I'll lose some audience if I do so. Um, so this, uh, with this and this, he managed to crack uh, the Wiener cipher, right? And so one of the objectives we can talk about is to determine the length of this key, right? And the way you do that is you analyze the distance between repeating substrate. So what I mean by that is if you have a long message, right? T H E, right? So if you have a long, if you if you have a long message, say thousand thousand characters or two thousand characters, and THE is going to appear naturally, right? If if your message is in English, THE is going to appear a lot, right? So you find out the distance between consecutive THE, okay? So let's say the first distance between the first two THEs is sixty four, right? And the second and third THE is somewhere around say two hundred and forty, right? The third and fourth is say somewhere twenty four, right? So now with this you can in fact uh, identify the length of the key which we had remember this prob is what is called the cryptographic key right using you can, using words like these you can identify the length of the key because you can simply take the lcm of all the distance between thes and that is when the words have to start repeating again so i'm, I'm being extremely vague here but that is like a rough idea of what turing had done to uh, crack the cipher of course this was all much more formal but I'm just uh, uh, tuning it down for all of you, right? So in fact, uh, I, I, took, I stole this example from David Penn. So he's a cryptologic mathematician working at NSA, National Security Agency. So I've hyperlinked this lecture. It's, it's a fantastic lecture he has given where he talks about Caesar cipher, visionary cipher, and ultimately also goes to uh, Enigma machine if you're interested in it. I'll, I'll, I'll put the slides on my uh, homepage and you can access it from there, okay? And so ultimately, the goal of any encryption scheme is to reduce the probability that your message is being cracked. That's all you want to do in, uh, in, in when you're designing an encryption algorithm, right? So now I've just, so uh, this is, uh, so I thought I'll just, instead of having multiple pages for references, I'll just put one page and put all the references possible here. 
and so in fact this is the original paper by alan turing so it's it's typed now uh, in 1912 it was in uh, so uh, the, uh, the applications of probability to cryptography and one of the sections is where here he talks about how he managed to crack the Wigener cipher right it was uh, classified until and uh, for some time and it was released to the public only a couple of couple of um, some decades ago right and so in fact uh, uk's national archives also has an excellent blog on this so you can check these out also and so in fact there is another example of how a public key cryptography is carried out so this is a practical implementation of public key cryptography where people actually transmit messages by locking it in a box and there is a very clever algorithm which is involved here and uh, enigma machine which was used to communicate in world war ii i think uh, so there are like a couple of nice references here and the birthday paradox which i spoke about earlier so uh, there, there's some there are some really nice references here so birthday par paradox in fact like leads to a little bit more about uh, there's something called the birthday attack so in uh, so i'll not get into the details so the, it's explained it's explained beautifully here uh, so you you can check that out and so birthday attack is some 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 sort of a cyber attack right so uh, I'll, I'll not get into details and so then uh, Srinivas Bogle, who is uh, who is a scientist at the, what is called the Fourth Paradigm Institute in Bangalore, he talks about how math is how math and probability is used in sports, right? So he he's a cricket, uh, he's a ardent cricket fan. So a lot of it is about cricket, and I'm I'm definitely sure that if you watch this lecture, you're gonna enjoy it. And so then there's also this Manjunath Krishna Bol, who is a professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And he he gives he gave a fantastic talk on how statistics how st how easy it is to lie with statistics, right? And I mean, this is accessible to everyone, and I'm sure you'll able to enjoy this. And so this is one page called the Math Pages, so which is just a collection of facts on various topics, math, algebra, geometry, everything, right? So whichever one is accessible for you, I think you really should check out this this Math Pages, right? And there are also fantastic movies made. So this imitation game is uh, on Alan Turing. So the the one who cracked the visioner cipher. So if this doesn't motivate you to watch uh, the imitation game, I don't know what will. So go watch, watch all these movies. So it's a good good amount of I think it it will be a good way to spend your time, right? So these these movies and you you can take a look at all these uh, uh, references. And as I said, I'll I'll put them up on my homepage and you can take a look from there. Right? Um, Okay, so now we'll come to uh, like I'll just quickly. I don't think I'll elaborate. I'll, I'll elaborate on this since like I'm, yeah. So uh, we'll see how probabilities uh, or cryptography rather is used in real life. So you might have all seen what this end-to-end -end encryption is, right? So this in fact heavily uses uh, this in fact heavily uses uh, cryptography. That that's essentially what it does. You don't want to say you're sending a message to uh, your friend and you don't want anyone in between can tap wires to snoop on your message, right? And that is precisely what this end-to-end -end encryption offers. That is, you have, you you send a message which is decipherable by none, no one other than your friend. And uh, so, and they, they can reply back to you. That, that's, that's what this is. And next, this is what storing passwords is. How are passwords stored? You do not want to write down passwords and just keep them in the lock, uh, keep them in the cupboard or something, right? So if you're storing it online, how are they safe, right? So this is one place where, again, you encrypt your password in a way that it does not make sense to anyone else. And when you want it, it itself will automatically decrypt it back and give it to you, right? So this is this is another place where um, cryptography is used. And Thirdly, in the defense forces, Indian defense forces, when they want to communicate something, this is something which they have to use. That uh, they have to get if, if they have to relay a message to someone who is say a uh, uh, say a hundred miles away, they do have to use secure communication channels to get their message out. They do not want any of these informations leaking to the public or even worse to the terrorists, right? And finally, the most important thing which I think all of us are involved in is online banking. You do not want your a uh, card information etc to be out in the public but you have to input it somewhere right so when you input it it is encrypted and it is basically a bunch of nonsense that's what it gets conveyed as and then at the at the where it is supposed to go it go uh, 
makes sense back again and then it's it's used so these are like some applications of cryptography in uh, real life right saw some chat but i missed it okay okay things so, it's just mostly body both it's oh okay okay great so these are some these are some applications of cryptography in real life right and so this i think the major part of my uh, any uh, math part of my talk ends here and so now i thought i'll just give you a little bit of uh, this is something i think I, I found this story extremely fascinating when i first read it so do any of you recognize this person anyone and kashmira the answer the question is not for you i told you this hello bhaiya <laughs> yes Uh, I wanna say something. Uh, by seeing his photo and uh, coin in his hand, uh, is it that when he that spins that coin always head comes? Yes, he is the exact same guy. Recall his name by any chance? Uh, no, no, we I can't recall his name. Okay, that's that's a very good. That's that's a good. Uh, yes, he is the exact same guy. Okay, so the answer is on the next slide. But do not Google this guy. Okay, do not Google this guy now. Wait for ten minutes. It'll spoil the fun. Okay. Uh, okay so this guy was a former ma former magician okay he taught himself magic tricks from the age of 5 and he left home at 13 without the knowledge of his parents to travel with dai varnon dai varnon was one of the magicians right back then and so he dropped out of high school and he all he wanted to do was to read william fellers introduction to probability theory that was the only goal he had in high school right and what he supported himself by playing poker on chips between new york and south america and he earned himself a living by playing in clubs in and gambling in chicago and various places right and what does he do now this is the time for the big reveal he is now a professor of statistics and mathematics at stanford university right so this is something else, a story which i found extremely fascinating how a magician so the idea again is that he started learning probability all by himself so when he was gambling going in clubs etc that's how probability had its origins right so in in clubs and in casinos so all these and so this is what exactly he worked on and ended up doing a whole bunch of research just on this right so uh, as someone mentioned rishab i think he extensively studied randomness including coin flipping and as rishab mentioned again so he has this ability to flip the coin and land it in the way you want it to that is you can do it if you want him to do it 100 times heads in a row he can right so one of the experiments he did um was uh to study how if I, uh, if i can control say the ambient uh, ambient environment like temperature pressure etc if i can control all of this then Uh, and if i know how much force i'm flicking the coin with and where i'm flicking the coin and can i find out where it will whether it will show up heads or tails right so he in fact has done extensive studies on this so one uh, one such amusing incident which he did here is so uh, in the early stages when he was working on this problem so he decided to rent an electron microscope to find out how many times a coin turns in the air and based on that compute whether it's going to be a head or tail for a given initial position right and the electron microscope was rather uh, costly to rent as one would expect right and this genius being being this fantastic person he is what he did is he came up with an extremely elegant idea he tied the coin with dental floss okay and what you have to do to count the number of times the coin flips is simply unravel the dental floss until it's back straight again and count how many times it took for you to unravel right and that's the number of times it uh, the coin flipped in the air so he has done like all sorts of crazy experiments like these so in fact uh, this is the first lecture of his i watched it's hyperlinked again here so do take a look once you have the slide so in, he in fact came to cmi in october 2013 and he gave a uh, a lecture i think to a completely filled audience so there have been people who were complaining that they didn't have enough space to watch the lecture and this was back in 2013 when i was i think what 12 years old and he has been awarded needless to say has been awarded all sorts of things he is a fellow of the american math society national academy of sciences american philosophical society etc 
and quanta in fact uh, written an excellent article about uh, his his work and so ultimately i think the key takeaway is all you need to do to do math all you need is a curious mind and determination so i'll rest my time here thank you well i think this was definitely a very engaging and we have learned a lot actually to even look back after this session and that is why we also have a whatsapp group where we all can discuss about the questions that were presented in the start and during this talk i would like to thank aniruddin for taking this time uh, i know you have a very busy schedule <laughs> with your applications and all going on as well but we are grateful at the math to have you so thank you very much aniruddin i hope that this was as much fun for everyone attending as it was for us, the organizers. Have a good day, everyone.